having defined and analyzed consumer surplus, producer surplus, and social surplus, we're now in a position to go back to the situation we had a couple of videos ago, several videos ago, and answer the question, is monopoly better or worse than competition? On the upper left-hand side of the screen, you see that I've written the graphical interpretations of consumer surplus, producer surplus, and social surplus. Consumer surplus is below the demand curve and above the price line. Producer surplus is above the supply curve and below the price line. And social surplus is below the demand curve and above the price line. I need to identify those areas, consumer surplus, producer surplus, and social surplus, for the cases of monopoly and competition in the left-hand diagram. The answer I've typed in the upper right, and our purpose in this video is going to, is, is going to be to understand why that's the right answer. So let's start with competition. In order to, to discover these surplus areas, we need to know where we need to know the location of the demand curve, the price line, and the supply curve. Since I want to start with competition, let's do it in graph 3 first, and then we'll transfer it over to graph 1. So in graph 3, the location of the demand curve is here. The location of the price line is here. And the location of the supply curve is the same as the location of the price line. So now let's translate the, the, that over into graph number one. So the demand curve is here. The supply curve is here. And that's also where the price line is. So that's the setup for competition. So with that set up, let's get consumer surplus. So consumer surplus is the area below the demand curve and above the price line. I claim that's the area labeled with the, so I, I used red ink to label the points on graph number one, A, B, E, F, G, and H. So I'm working on consumer surplus for competition. And I claim that's that's the area GEA, because GE is the demand curve, and you need to be below the demand curve for consumer surplus. And AE is the price line, and you need to be above the price line for consumer surplus. And so GEA is going to be the consumer surplus area. So that proves that the consumer surplus area for competition is GEA. Next, producer surplus. So producer surplus is the area, as you see here, it's the area above the supply curve and below the price line. But as I said in graph number three, the supply curve and the price line are the same place in competition, and therefore producer surplus is zero. So that explains why I've written here that producer surplus under competition is equal to zero. And finally, social surplus. Well, social surplus, uh, that abbreviated with SS, is the is consumer surplus plus producer surplus. Of course, if you add a producer surplus of zero to consumer surplus, you just get consumer surplus. And so that proves that the area of social surplus under competition is GEA. Now let's switch to monopoly, and I'll erase the competitive lines. So for monopoly, we need to identify the demand curve, the supply curve, and the price line. Well, the demand curve is, is pretty straightforward. It's the demand curve. Uh, let's do the price line next. The price for monopoly is PM, and so this is the price line. How about the supply curve? Well, that's a problem, because I said the monopolist doesn't have a supply curve. The monopolist has a supply point. So actually, we have to modify the definitions a little bit to get it correct for the monopolist. Instead of referring to the supply curve, we need to change that to the marginal cost curve. And this will also work for com competition, because for competition, you know this co competitive supply curve is the marginal cost curve. 
uh, at least the bottom of average variable cost, which is where it matters, because otherwise q is z, uh, q is equal to zero, and then it doesn't contribute to any kind of uh, surplus. Okay, so with this modification, we just need to indicate where the marginal cost curve is, and the marginal cost curve is here. So having located the three lines, let's work on the case of monopoly. Consumer surplus for monopoly. It's supposed to be GFH. Let's show that. Well, consumer surplus is below the demand curve, so below GF. And above the price line, the price line is FH. So below GF, above FH, there you have it, GFH is the consumer surplus for the monopoly. Okay. Producer surplus. Above the marginal cost curve, below the price line. The marginal cost curve is AB. Now the reason I don't say AE is because you only go to QM. Anything to the right of QM is totally irrelevant because the monopolist isn't producing it. So to repeat, it have to be above the marginal cost curve that is above AB. Below the price line, the price line is FH or HF, whichever way you want to say it. So above AB, below HF, so you get a producer surplus of HFAB, which is there. Social surplus, that's the sum of those. So you put them together, it's below GF and above AB, so it's GFBA. All right, now let me do some erasing. And we finally have our conclusion. I'll use green for competition. So the social surplus for competition is G E A. And I'll use purple for monopoly. The social surplus for monopoly is G F B A. Which one is bigger? Well, clearly GEA is bigger than GFBA. And therefore, we conclude that competition is better than monopoly because it generates more social surplus. So that's the conclusion. Competition is better than monopoly. Finally, we, we have a name. For, for this area. Okay, this is the area which is the difference between the bigger social surplus you get for competition and the smaller social surplus that you get for monopoly. This is called the deadweight loss to monopoly. All right, so the term deadweight loss refers to the loss in social surplus that comes about when you have a monopoly. And the reason why you got this, this is the following. The monopolist, as compared to the competitive industry, produces less, QM is less than QC, and charges a higher price. PM is bigger than PC. Let's see why. The ultimate reason is because the monopolist margin revenue curve is completely different than the competitive firm's margin revenue curve. Okay, the competitive firm's margin revenue curve, as you can see from graph number two, is flat. The monopolist margin revenue curve is, as you can see from graph number one, is downward sloping. The monopolist knows the real demand curve, so he knows the sad truth, which is that if he wants to produce more output, he's going to have to lower his price. The competitive firm doesn't think that. The competitive firm thinks price is given, so he can produce as much as he wants, and the price is not going to be affected. But, not, but the monopolist knows if he wants to sell more, he's going to have to reduce his price. And so what that means is the monopolist, when he's thinking about reducing output, I mean increasing output, has to think not only about the fact that his costs are going to go up, but he's also going to think about the fact that his price is going to have to go down. 
if he wants to sell more, he's going to have to lower his price. And since monopoly, just like competition, doesn't have anything to do with price discrimination, the monopolist sells at one price. He sells all his units at one price. So if he's going to, if he wants to produce one more unit, he's going to have to drop the price on all the units that he sells, not just on the last unit that he sells, not just on the, the one extra unit. So the monopolist is kind of reluctant to increase output because of this effect on price, that the more he increases output, the lower price he's going to be able to get for his product. The competitive firm doesn't have that effect, doesn't see that. And therefore, the monopolist is more reluctant than the competitive firm to increase output because increasing output has this negative effect for the monopolist that it doesn't have for the competitive firm. Because the monopolist is more reluctant than the competitive firm to increase output, the monopolist doesn't produce as much in the end. That's the reason why the monopolist ends up producing less than the competitive firm. And of course, if you have a downward sloping demand curve, then whichever one is going to produce less is going to have to charge a higher price, because that's the way demand curves are shaped. If your quantity is less, then price is higher. So it's not that the monopolist starts out saying, ah, I got a monopoly, so I can charge a higher price. In fact, in some sense, it's almost the reverse. The monopolist knows a sad truth that the competitive firm doesn't know, which is namely that if he increases Q, he's going to have to lower his price. And it's because of that sad fact of life that the monopolist realizes that he ends up doing what he does. So that's the interpretation, that's the intuitive interpretation of the result that we get. It uh, generates a deadweight loss to monopoly, and that's the reason why economists say monopoly is bad, because it generates less social surplus. The economists don't say monopoly is bad because it generates less consumer surplus. It does generate a whole lot less consumer surplus, but that's not the point. The point for the economist is to look at social surplus. Social surplus has shrunk, and therefore monopoly is bad. One justification of the economist's position that only social surplus matters, that consumer surplus and producer surplus are irrelevant except to the extent that they add together to get social surplus. It's like, well, suppose you were, let's say, a, a pro-consumer. Suppose you're a representative of the consumers. You always want what's good for the consumers. Um, actually, let me flip it around. Let's say, suppose you were pro-firm, and you always uh, wanted what was best for the firm. You were an industry lobbyist. Okay, you might still say that uh, the competitive situation, PC, QC, is the best situation because then there's a lot more consumer surplus and that consumer surplus could be taxed away from the consumers. Part of it could be taxed away from the consumers and given to the firms. Think about this. The consumer's surplus at the competitive equilibrium is GEA. Suppose you taxed a little bit more than HFBA away from consumers and gave it to the firms. Well, consumers before the tax were enjoying GEA in consumer surplus. Now you've taken H a little bit more than HFBA away from them, but they still got some left over. So they still have some consumer surplus. Um, and in fact, it's bigger than GFH. So it's the consumers are still better off than they were under Monopoly. And the point is that the industry is better off than it was under Monopoly too, because now the tax is a little bit bigger than HFBA, and so it can get a little bit more than it got under Monopoly. Okay, the point is this. There's a way of making, of going from the monopoly situation to the competitive situation and actually making both the monopolist and the consumers better off. And the way to do that is start from the monopoly situation, go to the competitive situation, but then tax some of the gains that the competitive situation has accrued to the consumers. Think it, the when you go from monopoly to competition, consumers gain, 
H F E A. Producers lose H F B A. So what I suggest is tax consumers H F B A plus a little bit more. Give the tax to the firms. Okay, so producers lose HFBA, but they're going to receive HFBA plus a little bit more, so they don't mind the change from monopoly to competition. How about consumers? So consumers originally gained HFEA. They had to give away in tax a little bit more than HFBA. Consumers still have left a gain of almost F E B. It's not quite F E B because the the tax they paid was HFBA plus a little bit more, but it's almost FEB. So it's a win-win. Uh, the firm, when you move from monopoly to competition, and then you tax the winners, that is the consumers, and you give the tax to the losers, who are the producers, then the producers end up being better off by this little bit more, and the consumers have a gain of almost FEB, and so they're better off too, so it's a win-win. And this is a, a kind of situation which we'll talk about more at the end of the uh, semester when we talk about uh, Pareto improvements. But it's an idea that if you have an inefficient situation, that is a situation with not enough, and I, ha I know I haven't defined efficiency yet, we'll get that later, and a situation where you have a deadweight loss, where social surplus is not maximum, then if you move to a situation where social surplus is maximized, there's a way of making everybody better off with some kind of uh, transfers. Taking money away from the winners and giving it to the losers, you can actually have a win-win situation when you move to from the situation where social surplus is not maximized to the situation where social surplus is maximized. So that's the ultimate reason why economists are just concerned about social surplus because anything that increases social surplus could actually be shared in a win-win manner.